everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon. I'm the CEO and co-founder with Impetus Digital. At Impetus Digital, we have built some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration and communication tools. We have worked with life science companies over the last 13 years to help them with everything from virtual advisory boards, online medical education, digital investigator meetings, and since the launch of our award-winning Insight Events platform, we've also been helping pharma companies with large corporate events, MSL and sales training, innovation hackathons, and all kinds of really innovative things. But more importantly at Impetus, we really believe that everything starts with a conversation. And from these big, hairy, audacious conversations with some of the leading edge thinkers, the digital provocateurs, the healthcare thought leaders, we can all work together to collectively and positively disrupt healthcare. So I'm super excited about having one of these thought leaders at the table with me today. And this is actually Dr. Justin Barrett. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of a company called Oso VR. We're going to get all into all things that are virtual reality today. Um, Dr. Justin Barrett is a board eligible orthopedic surgeon with a bioengineering degree from UC Berkeley, as well as an MD from UCLA. He completed his residency at UCLA and his fellowship in pediatric orthopedics at Harvard, as well as Boston Children's Hospital. Justin is currently practicing at the Orthopedic Institute for Children. Justin, who has been a lifelong coder um, and has a game credit with Activision, he originally wanted to be a game developer. So when a personal family health incident, unfortunately was introduced to him, um, and it introduced him to the world of healthcare. So he decided that he wanted to find a way to combine his passions and his use of technology to help to solve really difficult medical problems. So during his residency, Justin identified that he could be one of the most pressing medical challenges of this century. And the question was, how do we train surgeons? So with the, a strong interest in gaming and a firsthand understanding of the challenges facing residents today and, you know, and of, of really of experienced doctors, he co-founded Oso VR and with basically a mission to improve patient safety and democratize access to modern surgical techniques. Welcome, Justin. So happy to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, it's absolutely fantastic. Absolutely loved going through that whole background. It's such an impressive background. Um, loved if you could delve into a little bit about you know, your merging of academic and, you know, sort of your professional journey um, and sort of what sorts of things transpired for you and, and how you landed and where you are today. Yeah, it's been a wild ride and I wouldn't say it's been, you know, super well planned out, but everything really worked out in the end. Um, and like you said, I, I started out my kind of life, very passionate about video games and wanting to develop them. And, um, you know, when I had that family health incident, I just started wondering to myself, maybe there's a way to use software and technology, not necessarily for entertainment, but to help people. So that led me to change my major from computer science to biomedical engineering. Um, and in my mind, I had this goal or this vision that I really wanted to create technology. I want to invent technology, but I had no idea how to get started. And so I was kind of asking around and talking to a mentor of mine. I was uh, actually getting breakfast with my mom's gastroenterologist, which we all do, right? Um, and he told me that uh, a piece of advice that really sticks with me to this day he said, if you want to invent something, you really need to understand the problem you're trying to solve first. And he thought a really fantastic way to understand medical problems was to be a doctor. So in retrospect, I think I was very impressionable at the time and I took his advice very literally. Um, and so yeah, I went to UCLA for, for med school and then uh, stayed there to do my orthopedic surgery training. And then it was there that I experienced firsthand what I think is one of the biggest problems we face in healthcare today, which is how we train and assess healthcare professionals for procedures and surgeries. And, you know, I had the opportunity to train in some of the top hospitals in the world. Um, and I want to be clear, like these are top hospitals, like the care is uh, generally outstanding and all of the peoples and treatments that we have are, are miraculous. Uh, but I, I did from time to time, you would see situations where, you know, someone might even fly in from another country to get the very best care. And instead of helping with the surgery, I might be at a computer kind of Googling for videos or instruction manuals, like while we're, we're operating, because we're using cutting edge technology or techniques, or maybe it's a procedure we haven't done in a while because it just came through the door suddenly. Um, I always tell 
this one story, it's kind of an extreme example, but I feel like really kind of highlights the issue. Of you just never know what you're going to deal with on any given day as a healthcare professional. One day I was just eating lunch, minding my own business when our team was called by the zoo to operate on a gorilla. And <laughs> we're like driving down there, like, we're like, why did they call us? And like, we're Googling like gorilla anatomy. Um, and that went great. Um, and was a wild experience, probably one of the best surgical experiences I'll ever have. But, um, you know, we're dealing with gorilla-like situations every day in healthcare. Um, so the problem to me boiled outside, obviously, of the pandemic, which has accelerated all of these issues for which we can talk about later. But there were really three core dynamics at play that I was noticing. One is there's just too much to learn. So we're kind of victims of our own success. Accelerating science and technology is expanding the library of procedures healthcare professionals are expected to know how to do on demand. Um, so it feels like we've gone from maybe say French laundry to cheesecake factory where it's like we're spread a little too thin and you can't do everything well. Um, I love cheesecake factory, by the way. Um, <laughs> second part of the problem is modern surgery, modern procedures, people don't really talk about this very much, are much harder to learn, uh, surprisingly, than traditional open surgery. So minimally invasive techniques like arthroscopy, laparoscopy, robotic surgery, patient specific surgery have much longer learning curves. So a traditional surgery might have a learning curve of say like 20 cases, meaning you have to operate on 20 people to achieve sort of a safe proficiency level. Whereas with most modern procedures, it's more in the 50 to 100 range. And then the final piece of the puzzle is that we really lack an objective way to assess technical proficiency uh, in the world of healthcare. So it's not that we don't want to, we don't really have a good way to. So, you know, as an example in my career, the one time I was really sort of objectively and formally assessed for the ability to use my hands, I was literally asked to play the board game operation and remove some plastic pieces without buzzing, which I did. Uh, but, you know, I think we can do a bit better. So I was seeing all of that firsthand when I got involved in VR at the very beginning because of my gaming background. And I was like, wow, oh my God, what an incredible solution for this problem. You use it anytime, anywhere, train on any procedure, use your hands in a realistic way, you can train as a team and train remotely, which is a whole other issue that I'd love to talk about uh, uh, later. And then you can also get objective assessment for one of the first time. So kind of came up for this concept for Oso VR, um, built the first version myself, met my co-founder on the internet. Um, you know, I had some money saved for my bar mitzvah, which I used to kind of like fund the, the company initially. And then investors got interested. And, you know, we both went full-time in October of 2016. And today we're over 140 people training around 4,000 healthcare professionals a month used in over 30 countries uh, with a mission to improve patient outcomes with better education and assessment, increase the adoption of higher value medical technologies and techniques, and then democratize access to surgical education for everyone everywhere. Beautiful. What a great story and really want to dig into this as well. So obviously firsthand knowledge, you know, in orthopedics, you're realizing, you know, there's a much better way of doing this. And so, you know, the launch of this fantastic company. Tell us a little bit about, um, so obviously you shared with us what the problem statements were and are. So tell us what you started, what your first attempt at, at this was. So did you immediately think about technology? Were you thinking about, you know, uh, the Oculus or some VR headset? What were the steps that you approached to create the solution that you have today? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Um, you know, this this technology can be used anywhere and it, its application are so broad and deep within healthcare. It's, it's kind of a problem in itself in that it's, you know, you, it's very easy to lose focus because if you try to do everything, you're not really going to get anywhere. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that simulation is not new. The idea of, hey, we should practice in a safe environment, not on people, um, and, you know, try and get some sort of objective assessment. And this has been around for decades, this concept, but it hasn't really taken off in a major way. And, and why is that? With Part of it is that we've been reliant on a custom technology that is very bulky, very expensive, and not very accessible. So, you know, at the end of a 30 hour shift, you know, I would, you know, be asked to go to a simulation center or to go, you know, practice on a cadaver. And, you know, I haven't seen my family in like two days. I haven't certainly haven't slept or eaten anything. Usually maybe I'll have a graham cracker with some peanut butter on the elevator. So I'm not going to have time or the luxury of going to a simulation lab. So that, that was a whole other issue of the accessibility component. And not to mention more rural areas or low middle income countries, of course, have nowhere close to access to technology like this. Um, so that was kind of the last generation of simulators. And it also never really turned into a big business either. And, you know, 
we're now realizing as healthcare professionals, understanding and harnessing the power of a successful business model is very important to distribute new techniques and technologies. So that's important as well. And the problem was, is that no one had identified a need to have value proposition. Basically, uh, for a hospital or uh, academic medical center, a simulator was a sad story. It's, it's a nice to have. It's a luxury. You know, it's, it's not going to change the amount of revenue that hospitals bringing in. It's probably not going to affect patient outcomes uh, or the cost of care in, in a meaningful way, which is having one simulator in a building that maybe people use once a year, right? So the first question I asked is, where is an existential need? What is a value proposition that will drive a demand so high that if you remember in the early days of VR, like it was pretty clunky. Um, so the technology was amazing, but not slick by any means. You, you needed these towers set up. Uh, there was a computer the size of a small toaster that had to power it. So it's, you know, it's not something that was just going to like sell itself. So you really needed someone that had a problem that was so big that they didn't care that there was some friction around the experience. And to me, that was related to complex surgeries and technologies where what I was seeing time and time again is that a company like Johnson & Johnson or Stryker would actually pay, like, pay to fly me out to Hawaii, Las Vegas, Florida to practice on their newer technologies like robotics or navigation. And you know, I would have the opportunity maybe to try it once or twice on a cadaver or some sort of physical simulation lab. And then I would get to use the technology on a patient months later, maybe like four to six months. And so now you're operating on a patient with a technology used one time six months ago that we talked about earlier, might have a learning curve of a hundred cases. That's not gonna go very well. And so it's so common in the industry, there is an expression for it, it's called one and done. Basically, new technology is getting trialed, but not adopted because it's too hard to learn or we're not getting enough reps in prior to using on real patients. And the perception is, oh, these technologies are unsafe or they're too difficult to learn when really we just didn't have enough training touch points. And so I'm like, oh, well, maybe if we work in partnership with industry on these technologies, we can kind of accelerate that learning curve to drive the adoption of these newer technologies which are all you know, generally higher value, meaning that they're lower cost or uh, provide better, more consistent outcomes for patients. And so we had a laser focus on that. And especially in the early days, a lot of hospitals and residency programs wanted to partner with us. And we're like, we, we will get to that, but we really need to focus on the highest priority here. And, and that's really paid off. And now we work with, uh, we're in every space, by the way, we did start in orthopedics, but we're universally uh, we see ourselves as a universal simulation platform, but working with all of the uh, so-called major manufacturers uh, within orthopedics and expanding very rapidly. So um, it was a very interesting case study in kind of the challenge of focus, especially in uh, when working with a technology that's as powerful as something like virtual reality. Yeah, you um, work with, like you said, a lot of well-known medical device companies, you know, Johnson & Johnson, Microport, Smith & Nephew. What would be some examples of some successful case studies that you have done with one or some of them? Well, I could say that, um, you know, with uh, one of our partners, you know, you could think of it from like a business standpoint where, you know, we're driving adoption of these technologies and, and uh, you know, requests for implementation or, or, or trying the technologies. And, you know, a, a big challenge we have now is not just the adoption, but even knowing that these things exist. There are so many techniques and technologies now that, it's created a new challenge. I call it the exploration challenge or technology exploration challenge. So I don't even know what's out there. And the main way that I would get this information would be by going to in-person conferences, which is very hard to do these days. And so uh, being able to expose people to newer technologies so they could rapidly understand what is this and what's the value proposition. But I'll say from a, a you know, we, we have published data and we'll probably talk about it later that shows that our technology improves performance anywhere from 230 to 300%. But even for me as a surgeon, I'm like, well, what does that really mean? You know, that sounds amazing. And so there's one story uh, where we trained a surgeon that just really hits home for me that I think is just a very powerful case study where this is a fully trained surgeon. He's a joint replacement surgeon. He's out in practice and he's trying to transition from one form of hip replacement, what's called a posterior hip replacement to an anterior hip replacement, which is seen as a more minimally invasive version uh, presumably with faster recovery and lower dislocation rates. It's, it's a little controversial in our field, exactly what the advantages are, but it's still, it's very popular right now. The challenge is that it's hard to learn. For a fully trained surgeon, so someone who is fellowship trained joint replacement surgeon, 
it will take them 50 to 100 cases for them to transition from a posterior to an anterior hip, meaning that, you know, maybe you're getting one to two reps in on a cadaver, but then you're practicing on, you know, roughly about 50 people or maybe even more. And that'll take anywhere between six to 12 months, depending on your case volume. So this surgeon, um, what's really interesting, uh, operated on a patient on her right side. It was a challenging case. It took about three hours and 30 minutes. Ideally, you want to be between one to two hours for a proficient surgeon for this particular procedure. It's, it's just one metric that's easy to look at. Uh, obviously, we're never rushing as surgeons, but it's a good sign that you're being efficient, which is a sign that the surgery is going well, just in case anyone's worrying in the audience that they might be getting a procedure soon. So we took this surgeon and we ran him through an OSOVR curriculum. And so what that curriculum looked like is he did about you know five to seven minutes of sessions in the pro- platform. It's, it's kind of very sort of compressed. So you can get a lot done in a short period of time. And actually he did 91 sessions. So spent about six hours total over about a two-ish week period. And then a remote expert came in from a different state, but jumped into VR. So you're in the same room together in a virtual space and gave him some tips and tricks and kind of polished up uh, kind of his learning curve. And then what's really interesting is at the tail end of all of this, actually operated on the same patient, the three hour and 30 minute patient, but just on the other hip. Most people have two hips, um, hopefully. And so that side, after training in OSO VR for 91 sessions, about six hours, took one hour and 45 minutes. So about half the time of the other side. And, you know, when everybody heard this, it's just like our, our team started crying. They were just like so moved because to see it directly impacting someone in such a major way and the recovery was faster. Everything was better about it by like a long shot. So I had the opportunity to talk with this surgeon and I'm like, hey, like, you know, a lot of things go into this. You know, I, I think our technology is awesome, but I'm incredibly biased. So I want to hear from your perspective, like how how much of an impact do you think this actually had? And he said, I am at case 10 where I expected to be at case 50. And this 5 x my learning curve. And that just blew my mind because it's, it's more effective than I ever thought it could be. My mind, what I'm doing every day is I'm like, okay, well, if this is just one surgeon we're helping, what if we help 10 surgeons? What if we help 100? What if we help millions and the billions of patients they're taking care of and they're 5 xing their learning curve? They're not practicing on 40 people they are increasing their performance 2 to 3%. I'm like, the, the impact on healthcare delivery around the world, that's insane, all while using what is, in a way, video game technology. And I call it the quiet revolution of OsoVR because it's, it's so crazy when you think about what we're actually doing and accomplishing, but you would never know it's happening because it's, it's moving so fast and it's kind of, you really have to dig into the data to realize kind of the benefit that's being injected into the system. Yeah, that's a really impressive, impressive example. And certainly I think this could be augmented with the level one randomized blinded study that you've just conducted. Maybe you can explain what that study was about and the results and what people are going to be looking forward to based on on that data. Yeah, well, I think, you know, what I shared with you was anecdotal and, you know, was a case study, you know, not incredibly scientific, but to me, it, it resonates and is easier to understand. That being said, we do have published scientific studies, as you say, in clinical trials. And as a surgeon myself, like VR is so cool. And I think that is kind of one of its powers, but also one of its detriments. It it can, uh, it can pull people in, but rapidly burn them out if it's just seen as a novelty. So I wanted to make sure that this really worked and that this solved the problem. And it wasn't just kind of a shiny object. So um, we put a lot of work in very early on and made partnering with independent uh, academic medical centers for them to validate the technology. So one of the first studies that was performed was at UCLA where they took 20 trainees, 10 were trained in OSO VR to a set level of proficiency, which could be measured. And then 10 were trained traditionally. So this is consists of lecture, reading manuals or technique guides, uh, getting a list of steps and things like that. And then both of these groups went into a test environment where they performed the procedure and then they were evaluated by a blinded observer. So someone uh, basically reviewed videos of their performance, not knowing which training they had performed. And the results of that study, when evaluating these individuals using something, it's alternatively called the Global Rating Scale or OSATs, um, found that the OSOVR Train and Assess group performed about 10 points better, 230% better as evaluated by this scale, um, which is a, a very large difference. Um, and this was published in the uh, Journal of Surgical Education last year. Uh, the next uh, randomized blinded trial uh, was performed at University of Illinois Chicago. And this was really interesting because 
This actually looked at the ability to perform a procedure without needing supervision. And this is a pretty important metric because um, there was a semi-recent study, this came out in 2017, but this actually found that at the end of your formal training, basically, you know, for us as surgeons, you know, saying, say you want to become a surgeon after high school, you're going to four years of college typically, then you're going to medical school, which is another four years. Then you're doing internship and residency are typically now combined for the most part. So that's about five years. And then you're the vast majority, 90% plus of people now do one to two years of fellowship training on top of that. So you're looking at roughly 14-ish years. And at, at the end of all of that, the study in the Annals of Surgery in 2017, at least at the end of residency, found that 31% of those graduates still could not operate without someone supervising them. So I think it's a very important metric to look at because you know they cited in this study a lot of the dynamics I pointed out earlier in our conversation. And so what this study found is that in a traditionally trained cohort, that 25% of this group could complete a procedure without needing someone to step in and supervise. But when trained with OSO VR, that went up to 78%. So that's why we say there's a 300% improvement in the ability to perform a procedure without needing supervision. So that was an incredibly exciting metric to look at because that's always our biggest fear, like whether we're in training or in practice, that you know we're able to complete a procedure without needing someone to come into the room, without needing to call someone, uh, have someone look over the, the sh your shoulder. I mean, you're lucky if you can get those things, because um, oftentimes you're uh, maybe texting or calling someone after the fact. You're like, hey, do you think this looks okay? <laughs> Can't really do anything about it now, but I'd love to know. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, what I think is really important here is that <clears throat> There is, you know, these are really important metrics. You know, there's a scalability to this. There's probably huge ramifications, you know, at a very large level when it comes to things like cost. And I'm just curious about the OSO VR business model. Obviously, what you're sharing, there's dramatic impacts on healthcare institutions. I know that you partner with, with places like the UCSF, Marshall University, and the Hospital for Special Surgery, amongst others. What how do you explain this and, and how do you set up the business model so that people can say, yes, there is a return on our investment and here's what we can actually show for investing in also? Yeah, I think um, it depends on kind of what angle you're looking at. Generally, what we're trying to do is, you know, that third part of our mission is democratize access to surgical education. You know, I, um, you know, we're still working out new ways for us to get people access to our technology, but, you know, I will say that, you know, as a healthcare professional, having to pay money to get your license, having to pay money to do your CPR training, having to pay money to get your fluoroscopy license. It's, you start to get fatigued, like not from the education itself, but from sort of being nickel and dimed for it, you know? And, and I'm, you know, in a relatively affluent area and it's like, you know, it gets exponentially harder depending on where you're located. Um, so, I think our goal is to make it as easy as possible for anyone who has an Oculus Quest or an Oculus Quest 2 to get access to our technology. Um, but you know, we do have models where we could partner with academic medical centers. It's um, you know very economical for them. Um, it's um, and then uh, with uh, medical device companies as well, where you know for them it's really about once again solving that exploration challenge. Now it's how do we get exposure of these newer technologies to healthcare professionals so that they're not just sitting in the status quo and then rapidly train them up in a measurable way so that we can drive adoption and ultimately utilization of these technologies, which are better for all of us, which provide very consistent trackable care um, and really start to sort of standardize how we're delivering procedural care uh, all around the world. It's, it's a very exciting opportunity. Um, but it's sort of a problem that no one really foresaw as you know, these huge investments in what's called enabling technologies or robotics took place that everyone was so excited about kind of getting these out there and not realizing that the, the learning curve would be a challenge. And not only that, but um, now surgery is not so much powered by metal and plastic, but by software. And the advantage of software is that you can update it at any time very quickly. Uh, but imagine that you learn to do surgery one way, and then the next day, you're suddenly supposed to do it differently, right? So the training challenge is not only harder with robotics in general, but it also changes much more rapidly than it would with a traditional technique. And so it's, it's hard to keep up with as well. So these are challenges we now realize exist, uh, but we have an incredible solution for it that's already being used today all around the world. 
And what about universities, you know, medical schools and the way they're thinking about medical education? Is this going to be a brand new way? Are people going into in-person IRL situations, you know, surgeries? What is this world going to look like? And tell us a little bit about what that legacy, like the legacy universities, is there going to be a new outcropping? Is there going to be a new type or style of education that's going to displace, you know, the Harvards and, and what have you? So what is medical education going to look like with also, you know, at the forefront? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a really good question. I, you should really talk with my friend Shiv Gaglani, who's the uh, CEO of Osmosis, which just got acquired by Elsevier, super excited for them, but they're really tackling kind of how to bring kind of med school education and nursing education into the new age. I'll say that, you know, I'll, I'll tackle kind of both questions a little bit separately, um, you know, starting with med school, like what med school is, I think has changed over the years. And I think we're now kind of questioning ourselves, like, what's the point of this? Like, what are we trying to produce? What are we trying to do? Um, it's it's very expensive. It's very time consuming. And it it doesn't seem particularly applicable. You know, if you talk with, you know, most residents or kind of recent graduates, um, <laughs> I'll never forget, like the first day uh, when I was an intern, I had a patient who, you know, said, I was like, oh, I'm like very anxious and about to throw up. And I'm like, oh, I, I hope you feel better. And this nurse is like, oh, well, do you want to give him some medication for that? I'm like, oh, there's medication for that? That's amazing. <laughs> so, you know, just like some, ba some basic stuff that I, you're not learning, like necessarily like how to take care of patients. You're, it's, it's much more memorizing like the Krebs cycle and things like that, which is very disconnected from modern medical care. So, you know, what do you, if you're, I'd say longer term, like I really would love to see med school become more efficient. Um, you're looking uh, at NYU is kind of leading the charge here. And Mark Triola is a huge leader in kind of uh, innovative and disruptive medical education and utilizing technology. But there are three years uh, for med school now, and it's free for everybody. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of the direction we should all be heading. And like, in my mind, if it was two years, that would be great. But what do you, what are you generally trying to do in med school? And I think the goal of the med student is to do well so that they can get into a residency program and also decide what career they want to pursue. So those are really the two things that they're focused on doing. And it's it's much less about skill acquisition, learning how to do procedures and stuff like that. That's what you learn in your formal training and internship and residency. You're learning things like anatomy and the language, but you like some skills like suturing and stuff like that, but it's it's very that's very basic and and not really you're really learning how to do it in in residency. So um similarly and, and the university setting, I mean, you're, you're not learning anything about medicine typically, right? Like maybe you're learning a little biochemistry, a little biology here and there. Um, and then even high school, middle school, you're going back. And so what do I see as the key challenges there? And, and to, to me, the challenge is not so much one of preparation, but one of exploration is uh, we sometimes can lack imagination as human beings. And we look to our peers and our superiors to decide how we wanna build our lives. And there are some of us that are very lucky that have neighbors and friends who are surgeons, they're anesthesiologists, they're radiology fluoroscopy technicians, their parents are surgeons or doctors. And they're like, oh, that looks really cool. I wanna do that. Like um, I have a, a cousin who is a neurologist that was part of kind of my inspiration. And uh, my best friend in college, her dad is a orthopedist and he was a huge inspiration. That's how I even knew it existed. And so, but if you don't know it exists, then you'll, you'll never pursue it. Or, or that, you know, a lot of people might maybe know these things that exist, but they're like, I can't do these things. And even in med school, this is a huge problem. What, what I see time and time again with med students is they'll rotate on orthopedics as maybe like an elective rotation in their fourth year, or maybe their last rotation as like an elective they got in their third year. And like, wow, this is so cool. I want to do this. And it's like, oh, well, tough. Like you got to build out your resume, like since year one you're never gonna get into residency program because it's so competitive. And they're like, well, that sucks. This is what I wanna do. But it was their exploration was way too late. And so for med school and, and universities, what I'm excited about this idea of career exploration, can we expose underrepresented groups earlier so that we can get them excited about these careers where we, we need people in them um, and also prepare them in a way as well. And we actually, this is really cool. We did an open innovation challenge with the Department of Education here in the US, um, where the basically the RFP was, hey, can we use VR AR to accelerate career exploration for people in high school and college? And we ended up winning that actually. So 
Um, most years, obviously, these years are a little bit different, but we do an event with them where we have sort of kids and teenagers come in and they try also VR. And like, I mean, every single one afterwards is like, I want to be a surgeon. Um, That's amazing. I think one said he wanted to be a TikToker, but most said surgeon. <laughs> or these days an astronaut too. Um, so, I mean, lots of great things here. We're talking about, you know, again, your direct target right now, which is really surgery. We've talked about this whole idea of getting people earlier on and down the, down the pipe, getting interested potentially in a medical career. But COVID-19 happened and changed the world. We had to get involved with remote collaboration. Some people loved it. Other people's hands were forced into it. What was also VR doing? What did the world look like before COVID and after? And has it somewhat changed the direction or the target audiences for, for your company? Yeah, I mean, it's changed everything, right? Um, you know, the, the first thing I want to say is that this pandemic has been very hard for healthcare professionals everywhere and, and for everybody, right? Um, and um, especially like, you know, I'm, I'm in orthopedics and, you know, we've taken a hit in some ways, but, you know, people who are uh, you know, critical care specialists, pulmonologists. And so, you know, I, I think it's very important to, in these times to come with a message of kind of positivity and optimism. And, you know, my message to technology companies around the world who are looking to disrupt healthcare is to recognize how amazing all of the things we have today are the the systems we have in place, the healthcare professionals, the treatments we have. Better is possible, as Dr. Otul Gawande said, but you can't discount that what we have is nothing short of miraculous today. Um, so I just want to kind of come out with that, saying that as it's kind of like, okay, what are the improvement areas, right? But it's like we're starting from a great place. But certainly, COVID has introduced some major challenges. Um, you know, in the in the early days, probably was where the biggest impact was felt, where um, residents were, you know, case volume went way down. So the experience went down. Residents were sometimes intentionally kept outside of the hospital as backups in case people got sick. People did get sick um, and, you know, were not able to operate. And now we're in kind of a sort of off and on situation, which is less intense, but certainly still uh, we're being affected. And the opportunities, a lot of our opportunities, both in for formal training and also um, once we're out in practice, involve travel. Um, and, you know, going to an in-person event where you get to practice on cadavers or with other people, and that has become very difficult. And most conferences, the attendance is quite down even today uh, still. Um, and so what this has done is really um, we're developing a lot of training or educational debt, um, which is a big challenge because, you know, let's say like you miss your second year of residency. It's not like you redo it. Now you're just kind of at your third year of residency, learning what you should have learned the second year. And it's not kind of like, it's not like everyone gets to learn together and you, you're not catching up. It's, that means the second year resident isn't able to learn because you're sort of taking their second year spot, if that makes sense. So you're really kicking the can down the road. And I'm sure that number of 31% is, is significantly worse post COVID than, uh, than it was before. And so we need to think about, okay, well, how can we accelerate learning and decrease the reliance on travel and in-person events? And so there are, this is a multifaceted problem. VR is not magic. It's not going to solve everything for us, but certainly we are a major part of the solution because you can train from anywhere. So you can get many more reps in from home. Um, you can get objective assessment. You can explore technologies without needing to go to in-person conferences or being as reliant on them. Um, you can get training from experts all around the world, once again, without needing travel. And I think, um, you know, for what's called formal training, I, I'd say still our, our highest volume user is what I call the early career surgeon. It's uh, counterintuitively where your educational burden is actually the highest. It's like you're kind of creating the menu of your own restaurant. But uh, for our formal training, what there's a dynamic that people don't really talk about very often. You know, we, we always, people know about the learning curve. They talk about the learning curve, but there's something called, I call the trust curve. You know, it's not like one day, you like flip a switch and everyone's like, hey, you're going to like operate on all the patients now or like do more of the surgery. What we're doing is we're watching residents over time. And as we get more comfortable with them, we're like, okay, we're going to let you do more and more of the procedure very gradually. And this can be a very glacial prog uh, process, especially at some larger programs where you're spending very little time with all of your instructors. So they don't see you enough to generate enough trust to give you significant autonomy. So you can go through a whole program and, and do very little surgery yourself, which means that you're going to be at a major disadvantage because you really need to get the reps in yourself under supervision, of course. And so what you can do with VR and objective assessment with OSO is 
you can generate that trust much more rapidly. So not only are you moving yourself along the learning curve, but you are demonstrating to others that you understand these procedures, that it's safe for you to do more of them, to get more autonomy earlier. And so you're starting at a more advantageous position from a learning curve perspective, and then you're going to get more reps in throughout the process. And um, this process is also described in what's called competency-based training models. Um, and Canada has done a great job doing some early experimentation with these models, which are mainly based on simulation, like what we do at OSO. And they found that you can potentially shave an entire year off of training with models like this. So um, everyone is very interested in kind of seeing how to sort of make models like this work. There's a very complex interconnected web of how formal training takes place and kind of our utilization, not just for our own education, but uh, you know what's uh, administrative work and the support that we do for these large hospital systems. It's, it's, it's complicated, but certainly this is a powerful tool to get us to make up that gap, that debt that we've developed, and then get us to a more sustainable future where we could have a more competency-based model. That's wonderful. Now, uh, you know, there's some really great things here. We've talked all kinds of things about assessment analytics and the way you're really moving forward in, in, in progressing training and thinking and learning. But there's also a lot of issues just generally with tech the technology. Um, a lot of people are going to say that VR is nothing new in terms of like the old headsets. So they're heavy and they're luggy and people get migraines or headaches, or they don't want to be in this thing all day and, and, and many other sorts of concerns. Tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe some of the Luddites, like some people who may not be wanting to adopt this, how, and some people may have thought that Google Glass was a little ahead of their time or behind or, but ultimately there's this ease and the, the streamlinedness of the, of the actual thing that you have to wear. What do you have to say about that? I think that, that problem was like a, a little bit of a problem of the past, maybe a year or two, but not really today. I think, you know, standalone VR, Oculus Quest 2 has become so ubiquitous that most people have tried it at this point and have kind of realized that the technology has evolved so quickly. It's, it's kind of astounding. You know, you look at the progress in a sort of a tangential space like AR and, you know, it seems like it's moving much slower than what's happened in VR. I think certainly especially things like Samsung Gear VR or Google Cardboard, I think set the whole space back because people thought that that was kind of what it was. And, uh, you know, that's that's not really a good example of the technology. But I think most people today are, are kind of realize that, you know, it's as long as you're working with the right content, um, you know, VR sickness should no longer be a thing. Um, you don't need a clunky computer setup. You can just put this on. It's $300 off of Amazon or Best Buy. It's it's kind of insane when you think about it, <laughs> like the power of the technology, the quality of the applications, including ours that are on here and, um, you know, just how affordable it is. So it's it's pretty wild that those kinds of considerations don't come up much anymore. What's still like if you get any pushback from a surgeon it's they feel very threatened that, you know, there's there's something very, um, I would say, like sacred about both operating on real people, hopefully for obvious reasons. It's it's our profession. It's the most important thing in the world to us. And then also, you know, to an extent, operating on cadavers too. I think you know, not many people talk about this when they mention kind of cadavers in passing, but these are people who have passed away and made a very brave decision to donate their body to science. It's a big deal. And so, you know, just sort of like casually being like, oh, we need to replace that and not do that anymore. I don't know. It sounds, you know, I think to surgeons rubs them the wrong way a little bit. And also I think they think that, you know, the, the art and the craft that we've been developing over a lifetime that, you know, some video game developers are going to replace that in some kind of magical headset thing. Like, I don't like that at all. And I totally get that. Um, but what, what we position is that we're not replacing in-person training. What we're doing is we're repositioning it along the learning curve. We're providing an objective assessment tool and we're making the whole process much more efficient and data-driven. And when you reposition it that way, almost every single, even the most skeptical healthcare professional uh, I've spoken to in the world will be like, oh, well, that makes a lot more sense, you know, because we all immediately, it's a, this is a very interesting space. Everybody, whether they're in healthcare or not, has imagined what a surgical simulator should look like. It's very fascinating. And it, it always looks very particular. It's like 100% realistic. It's very sophisticated with all sorts of force feedback. And it, it needs to look like that because it needs to replace operating on people and in uh, cadaver training. And you know, when you kind of be like, well, what if it looked like this? And what if you used it this way? I think people realize that they're like, oh, well, that 
actually makes a lot of sense. That would be quite helpful. And once you get them away from that initial image that we all have in our heads, even I did at first, you know, the, the acceptance is, is 99%. I've never seen anyone be like, oh, I, I don't see the utility in this. So um, that, that reluctance really was a thing of the past of the early days when VR was very clunky and the content was like, okay. Um, and then, you know, some of that kind of fallout from Google Cardboard, but we're in a pretty exciting space of a very rapid growth and utilization of the technology. Okay. So just to my last question, it's a little bit more rejection in the future. We're talking about all of this and how it applies today, but we've been hearing a lot about the metaverse and nothing, it's not new, it's been going on for years, <laughs> but it's now got this new sexy term to it because you know some Zuckerberg started talking about it. But anyways, I'm curious as well too, right now we're talking about VR, but and the idea of training using your technology. Are we ever considering the idea of the augmentation of your tool, your software, where people are actually going to be working in the metaverse, where people are going to be doing surgeries in the metaverse? I'm curious about your thoughts on that, um, all the ramifications associated with that, including patients giving consent about having technically a robot or something that's not really human doing their surgeries. Talk us a little bit about the ethics, the, the, the uptake, and the possibility of, of really doing this in the future. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's already happening today to an extent, like, you know, you look at Intuitive's Da Vinci, and it's basically remote surgery, you're in the same room. But, you know, you might as well not be you're not at the patient, you're at a console doing the surgery and a robot is kind of replicating your movements, um, you know, automated. So, you know, most surgery, like robotic surgery today is what I call augmented surgery rather than automated surgery. There are a couple of automated examples, but they're very rare and not widely utilized. So there's still like a human in the loop. And I think there probably will be for some time. I think there are very few applications where you could kind of just completely automate things. And joint replacement is kind of one of those because it's 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 a little bit like industrial manufacturing or subtractive manufacturing with like a CNC machine. So it, it is possible, but I think most surgeons and most patients don't like the idea of fully automated surgery, but they certainly like the idea of some sort of machine helping, um, you know, kind of like a, a sort of pseudo autopilot. So I think the acceptance of robotics is quite high. The demand is very high and, and people um, are, are enjoying that. So um, I think, you know, that's really, I mean, there, you're seeing some augmented reality applications in the operating room today, um, in, which are really like kind of iterative evolutions of existing technology. It's not it's, it's very cool, but it's not like a wild leap of kind of, oh my God, this is scary because th this technology has existed for decades. So, you know, for example, we've been using spine navigation for a number of years, uh, which is a very valuable technology. It's not perfect, but you know, it's like, would you rather have your surgeon sort of jamming a sharp probe into a bone in your spine, just kind of hoping it's not gonna go into the spinal cord or have a computer tell you that you're going in a safe location. That's kind of the difference between the two applications. The challenge is that the the screen is like over here and the person's over here. So you're kind of looking back and forth. It's, you know, it's it's not the end of the world, but it's not super comfortable. But now there's a company called Augmetics where you put on a headset and you can kind of see through the patient and you can be much more sort of ergonomic and efficient with the surgery by it's still the same navigation technology that hasn't changed, but it's in a new form factor where now it's kind of in line with your vision using kind of modern augmented reality methods. So I think, um, you know, a lot of these giant leaps, like, you know, are, is AI going to be doing my surgery? Not anytime soon, certainly like, um, and I think anything that would be fully automated would, would probably not be driven by AI since the um, outcomes would probably be unpredictable. Like it would just, it would just be doing a set thing um, and, and probably would not leverage much machine learning. Um, it's the computer vision in the surgical space is a hot area right now, but it is still very early. Um, in its ability to sort of delineate what exactly is going on, identify critical structures, things like that. There's some really cool uh, proof of concepts out there and examples and kind of early early technologies and companies, but it's, it's still very rudimentary from probably what people are imagining. So I think, you know, in the short term, you know, there's some remote proctoring stuff, which incorporates some augmented reality and telestration stuff here and there, uh, which is very cool. Companies like Proximy or Veil that you're seeing, um, there's you know, a lot of, I think, still research and effort going into true remote surgery, because it makes a lot of sense. Like, I don't think patients would be worried about, you know, if you're in a remote location, and you have an expert surgeon in a far off place, like, you don't want some local guy who doesn't know the surgery as well, you want the best person for the job. So like, yeah, I'd love someone to operate remotely on, on me. But 
I, I don't think like an AI in the cloud is going to be doing surgery on us anytime soon. I've been wrong before. I'm not, I'm not, not a genius or anything, but um, I think, I think the future is, is actually very exciting um, and, and not scary because we're, our hand is being forced by today's day and age. And also we have a growing comfort with technology, both in terms of acknowledging all the things it can do, but also the things that it can't. And I think understanding kind of that technology is not magic, um, but it can do some incredible things has led us to move a lot more quickly in healthcare in a, a responsible way uh, that we haven't done in the past, which everyone looks at like EMRs and that rollout is like, we should never incorporate any technology ever, um, which is, I think, just a great example of how not to do things. And, you know, we really are doing it differently going forward. Yeah, that's amazing. This was a very inspiring conversation. Obviously, Justin, we could speak for hours about this. I mean, I have so many other things I could ask you. We Keep it going. Be, we could probably <laughs> do a version two of this. I'm, I, I've got all kinds of stuff in my mind, including the fact of democratization of just health in general. And people are now going to be able to become surgeons, many surgeons across the world. Anyway, wow. if anybody is interested in speaking with Justin for a myriad of different reasons, he's obviously a walking encyclopedia, but also about his company, if you want to partner or work with or learn more about it, please look for his contact details in the show notes below. Um, if you also were interested in this conversation, check out impetusdigital.com. These are the kinds of conversations we have with physicians, payers, patients, allied healthcare providers, we work with pharma companies, medical device companies, you know, all sorts of different people to move strategies, agendas, ideas forward asynchronously over time. And we actually help um, service all of that and plan it for you. So check that out. We'd love if you can like and subscribe and please leave us a comment on iTunes. We'd really appreciate that. Thank you everybody for your time. We really appreciate you taking the time out to watch or listen. And thank you, Justin, for a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me.